in this series, when we talk about the abundant life, we said that um, we want to help you find freedom, not just religion, not just punching a ticket. We said last week, as we talked about open the gate, a lot of people have come to the gate. They have an experience with Jesus. They have an experience with the church, but they haven't opened the gate to that abundant life that Jesus talked about, coming in and out freely and enjoying life. We said that most people interpret the abundant life in two ways. One, they either interpret it with the false gospel that says that if you come to Jesus, then somehow now you're going to have money and fame and success and you know, you, you're not gonna ever experience suffering and that's a false gospel, it's a false claim and a false promise. And so if that's not true, because some people thought that was gonna be true and then they came to Jesus and they ex- experienced suffering, they didn't get all the things that they asked for for Christmas. Um, and and um, cause we treat Jesus like he's Santa more than we treat him like he's God. And um, so then they said, well, this gospel must not be true. And then we said the other way people interpret the abundant life is the afterlife. Maybe Jesus meant like later when we die. And so then we live our lives just hanging on, just living in our our shack, waiting on Jesus to come back and get us out of our basements that we were hiding in. And, um, but we cannot read the scripture and not interpret it that Jesus came to bring life here and now the abundant life here and now, that he said, listen, I didn't come so that you could get to heaven. I came so that we could bring heaven to earth through my children. And that's what we talk about because a lot of people, like church really doesn't change your life or impact you or the gospel doesn't impact you if you think Jesus only came to get you to pray a prayer and punch a ticket to go to heaven. Um, And so we talked about how some people, you came to the altar to Jesus, but the problem is they left you there. And so now you're like, what's the point? Why does this matter to me? It's not impacting my life. And that's what we're talking about throughout this series. We're going to talk about how do you find freedom in your soul and live this abundant life day in and day out here and now, regardless of what happens in the world and regardless of what happens in my external circumstances. So we're going to talk about all kinds of things. We're going to talk about um, sanctification. It's a, it's a real churchy word, but it means like this change that happens in our lives when we become believers. Because I think a lot of people think that when you come to Jesus, all of a sudden you're not going to struggle anymore. You're not going to be tempted anymore. You're not going to fail or sin anymore. And like there's, a, there's this process. And we're going to talk about our mindsets and why we are so prone to depression and anxiety and, and these mental issues that we battle and the battle of the mind. We're going to talk about... Uh, uh, this, this whole idea of, of um, unforgiveness and bitterness and why that's such a big deal and why, why we carry that in our lives. We're gonna walk through a very vast process of how we lead people to this freedom that Christ came to offer. Because I think if more believers were living the abundant life, more people would want what you got. And so today as we jump into this, I, I, and I warned you last week, if you're new with this, just know this is not going to be a typical weekend at Generation Church because today I got to introduce you to the bad news. So today is going to be heavy. It's going to be a little bit dark. But how many of you know when we talk about good news, good news is only expressed when you know that there's bad news. News is not good news if you don't know that there's bad news. It's just news. And maybe if, if the only news you watch is on TV or on social media, you know there's no such thing as good news anyways. But today I've got to introduce you to the bad news because I think that a lot of us, we forget when Jesus says in John 10, 10, this is our key verse for the entire series. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it what? Abundantly, abundantly. And... um. When we look at our world, depending on where you work, depending on how you grew up, it's really easy from time to time for us to forget that this world is messed up. But how many of you know there's something that happens, whether it seems to be weekly or monthly, that every now and then something dark happens to remind you, the fog is lifted in that moment to remind you, oh, it's bad out there. Um. You know, it's, I just read about a story about an ex-NFL player the other day who randomly killed five people, a doctor and his wife and their grandchildren, five and nine. And it's like in those moments when you think, how could somebody point blank shoot 
a five and a nine-year-old child. And that's the moments where all of a sudden the fog is lifted and we start questioning things, isn't it? That's the moment when we start going, wait a minute, something's not right in this world. But now if you work at some other places, if you're uh, Jason Williams, who is our police chief and also plays drums in our worship band, he knows every single day how dark the world is. You know, you, I, I, him, him telling me the weight that he carries of when you, when you walk into situations and you see the brokenness of people's lives, or you can go to the Ashley Center in Gallatin and listen to stories of counselors who have to talk to these children who have been sexually abused by their parents or by family or friends. That's when all of a sudden the fog is lifted and it's like, oh, wait a minute, there's something not right in this world. Maybe it's incidents like 9-11. Maybe it's been the past year of this pandemic and all the different things that there's times in our lives that all of a sudden we're reminded, man, there's something not right. Because for us, a lot of us, we're, we're kind of immune to it because we, we live in a, in a country that doesn't necessarily have to, you don't have to deal with it every single day of your life, but we watch the news or whatever, all of a sudden there's a reminder. And how many of you have ever like longed for peace? Have you ever like watched those stories or listened to those stories and you thought to yourself, I just wish things were, were better? Anybody? A few of us? Hopefully all of us? Or are you just like, man, I wish there were peace in the world. I wish that there wasn't murder. I wish there wasn't racism or hatred or anger or bitterness. Have you ever thought to yourself why you think that or long for that when it's never existed? In fact, this is the moment where it's ceased to exist that we just read about. And so how can we long for something that we've never experienced? Like I, I long for a good steak. You know why? Because I've had one. And when you've, once you've had a, listen, Alan Fike made me the best steak I've ever had in my entire life. And now I think about it very often. <laughs> now don't go asking Alan to make y'all any because he only cooks for me, but I'm just saying. I, I, he's my personal chef, that's right. But I can long for it because I've had it. Why do we long for peace when we've never had it? Have you ever heard of um, phantom pains? Anybody that's lost a limb they tell stories of how like, even though their right hand isn't there anymore, it itches or it hurts. And it's this phenomenon that happens with amputees and, and people who have lost limbs. It's, it's pretty crazy how like they can say, listen, I know my foot's not there, but it hurts. I can physically feel my foot hurting. And I believe a lot of times what we experience in our souls is phantom pains in our souls. Even though we have physically never seen or experienced peace, our souls know something isn't right and it longs to get back to a paradise that once existed. And so for us to understand that, it's, it's saying that our souls long for a paradise that's been lost. The world we now know is not paradise, but there once was. In fact, let's read about what that paradise was when we when, when the creation story unfolded in Genesis chapter one, verse 24, then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, <clears throat> excuse me, let us, this is the first moment in scripture we see the Trinity being represented. Let us, the Father, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, make human beings in our image to be like us. Now, when he says in our image, this doesn't mean like a reflection like you and I think. Um, he actually means it's a translation of a word called substance. In other words, we are the only part of God's creation that's made from the same substance, which is spirit. Like animals cannot worship God. I know that saddens some of you dog lovers. You think they're actually human beings. But we know they don't have a soul. We for sure know cats don't have a soul. The Bible says a third of the demons were sent to the earth, and they now exist in stray cats. Okay? But this is why 
an assault on our fellow human beings is so um, such an atrocity because that person in front of you, beside you, they have the substance of God in them. The spirit of God, the image of God, image bearers. Isn't that incredible? And he says, they will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings from his own substance and his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marked, marking the sixth day. When he finished his creation, the Bible says it was very good. The original Greek right there is a word called shalom. And shalom simply means perfect peace. He's saying right now, this paradise, everything is in perfect peace. And in fact, when you read the creation story, when it says he created the animals, it was good. He created um, the, the plants and the trees, and it was good. He created the firmament in the, in the sky, it was good. He created human beings, it was very good. In fact, in the original Hebrew, uh, the original Jews, when they read the original Hebrew, it's actually read and written like a rhythm. It's, it's, it's spoken in a rhythm. If you've ever heard, if, you're, if you've any kind of music background, there's a thing called the metronome. And drummers have to use this a lot, but like it's, they, they fascinate me up here because they play music while they have in-ears that have a click and a woman talking to them. Like I can't chew gum and preach at the same time, like much less like play. These guys are playing, singing, doing all this stuff with something in their ear and it's a click. It's a metronome. And they have their own language. They're real nerdy back there when they start talking about, hey, listen, at this time, we're gonna go to the one and the two and the three and the four. And I'm like, so do I come out on the two or the one? I don't know. Like, I'm, you know, when, when do I preach? You know what I'm saying? But they know, like, hey, I have to, and there's this click. It's a metronome. It tells them I've got to stay on this rhythm because when you have music that's in perfect harmony, how many of you know they're all on the same click? And so what God is saying in this moment, there is a perfect harmony in creation. And it's beating to my heartbeat. It's a perfect rhythm. And so he says not only that, but as at this point, and this is what we have a hard time, uh, we can't fathom this moment, but at this point, even creation itself, the only job Adam had to do, he never had to sow, all he had to do was reap. The ground produced fruit. Water was easily available. That's hard for us to fathom in America because when you're asked, hey, where do you get your water? Well, that's easy, from the sink. You just turn your sink on. But that's not true for most parts of the world. But at this point, paradise was perfect. Water was easily available. You just had to go get it. Fruit produced without you having to sow. It was just there. It was perfect. Creation was in perfect harmony. And not only that, God says, listen, I'm only gonna give you one rule. One rule, that's it. Look at Genesis chapter two, verses 15 through 17. He says, the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it, but the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Now, this is the moment where if you're not a believer or you're a doubter or whatever, you would push back and say, well, if God knew that this tree was gonna be the thing that was going to just send uh, the, the earth into this chaos and, and spinning out of order, why put the tree there in the first place? Why tempt them in the first place? I mean, it's kind of like putting a loaded pistol in, in front of your kids and saying, don't touch it. And so a lot of people say that's not a good God if he would allow that to happen, if he would create the tree. But it's a moment we understand that God loves us so much that he gives us the free will to love him back. Like, I don't know about you, but I don't wanna force anybody to love me. 
I don't want my wife to come home and like when I tell her I love you, well, I'm supposed to love you. So I guess I love you too. You don't want somebody to be forced to love you. You want somebody to what? Choose to love you. And what God is trying to teach them from early on is that obedience to God brings joy. And that's what we miss is that even in the midst of your doubts and your frustrations with your own life, can I tell you why you're in the midst of that tension? It's because you're trying to battle the tension between serving your own desires and serving God, and you'll never find true joy. And God says, man, I want you to know when you choose me, it leads to an abundance of joy. But you gotta choose me. But he gives them the choice to choose. And of course, if you know the rest of the story, you know that, Satan comes along in the form of the serpent and he tempts them and he gets them to ask this one question and it's the core of every question that sends us into our own personal spiral and it is, did God really say? And that is the initial question that all of us wrestle through at some point in our lives that either sends us towards following him or following our own personal destruction because the Bible reminds us that there is a way that seems right to man but in the end it leads to destruction. And so he says, did God really say? And you know what he was telling them? He said, listen, you know God's holding out on you. He knows that if you choose to eat this, you'll become a better God than he is. And that's at the core of all of our rebellion is that we think we know better than God. And so what do they do? They take the fruit. And don't miss this. The moment they do, the earth cracks. The moment they do this, know this, rebellion is declared and perfect rhythm is broken. Peace and paradise are now lost. There is no shalom. And now the metronome is off. And if you've ever listened to a band where they're all on a different page, it's not a pretty sound. It's chaos. And so chaos ensues the world breaks and it begins to shift and chaos and strife and suffering and violence and it began to turn into the world that you and I now see. It's broken. It's lost. The paradise that was once known is no longer anymore and it's a complete reorder. And let's look at some of the consequences of what happens in in the midst of the brokenness. It's found in Genesis chapter three, verse eight. It says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? I love his response. It's her fault. And not only is it her fault, it's your fault too, God, because you gave me this woman. She gave me the fruit, I ate it. And the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? She does the same exact thing. It's the snake's fault. That's why I ate it. And this is the moment where two things we see happen because of this rebellion. One, they spend the rest of their days hiding. You're here today and most of you are hiding or on the run from God. Because the moment you choose to rebel and declare your own independence, you sever yourself from the source of the Spirit of God. And now you're lost and you're in hiding. And the second thing we see, immediately what do they do? They shirk responsibility. And so what we did, God said, I've actually created you to have authority over the earth and to be ambassadors for my kingdom and take the kingdom of heaven and and spread this kingdom on earth. But the moment they rebelled, they gave authority to Satan. And now we spend the rest of our lives placing responsibility on everybody else but ourselves. That's why the moment somebody calls you out on something that you know you shouldn't be doing, what do you do? It's your mama's fault, it's your daddy's fault, it's your co-worker's fault, it's your wife's fault, it's your kid's fault, it's everybody else's fault but yours. That's a result of your fallen nature. It's a result of the rebellion. Because the rebellion says, I know better than God, I know better than everybody else, but everybody else won't let me live my life. And so now we spend our lives casting responsibility on somebody else when God said, I'm holding you responsible. 
I gave you authority. And look what happens. And so he says, the Lord God, oh, excuse me, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman. This is the first part in the Bible where we see the first prophecy. And if you don't know that word, it's a churchy word that just simply means God is proclaiming something now that will happen in the future. And this is the first prophecy we see of the cross. And he says, and between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. In other words, you'll crucify him, but he'll have victory over you by raising from the dead. And he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth. And the women said, mm-hmm. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Don't miss this. This is the moment. Now what we live in is constant strife in relationship. That's why you get married, and I get it. It's perfect matrimony once you get married, right? It's not. You know why? It's constant strife of one trying to rule the other one. And that's why it's so difficult. That's why relationships are hard. That's why divorce happens at a high rate, because of this rebellious nature, because paradise has been lost. Now we're in constant strife. And he says, and to the man, he says, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. We'll talk about that. And all your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. And the men say, mm-hmm. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow, will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, to dust you will return. So look at some of the repercussions. Remember before, all he had to do was go get the fruit and the water provided. Now God says, because you have rebelled, the earth is now cursed. Now you can't just go get water. You have to go dig it out from the ground. Again, that's easy for us. It's hard for us to fathom what that's like because you go turn your sink on and you have it but there are parts of the world that don't have it that easy. They have to go search for it. Like now you have to actually sow. You have to cultivate the ground in order for the ground. So he says the thing that, you, that should bring you purpose and joy, which was work, now work is frustrating and exhausting, right? Think about this. Man had four easy things that were his assignment. Work, provide, love, and serve. It was that easy. And now what we have are men who don't know their assignment. And when you don't know your assignment, you become bored. And there's nothing more destructive on the face of the planet than a bored man because he replaces his four assignments with destructive habits. So now you find your pleasure in pornography. You find your pleasure in trying to make more money. You find your pleasure in trying to work more so that you can have more. And so that is what you've done. You have replaced your assignment with destructive habits but it's a result of paradise lost because we are trying to recreate what we lost. We spend the rest of our lives trying to get back to the place that we were kicked out of. That's what we're really trying to do. And we're trying to recreate it in the wrong ways. Now we have pain, discomfort, suffering. We have all of these things that happen in our lives. And, and, and this is powerful because, because of death. It, it, remember I read that in, in Genesis chapter three, in my first verses, when he said that if we don't do something about this, they'll stay forever in this state. Can I tell you, this is probably counterintuitive or cultural to what you believe, but I believe the greatest gift God gives us is life. But can I tell you something that you probably didn't realize? Probably the second greatest gift God ever gave us was death. Because imagine if we stayed in our current state for the rest of our lives. Could you imagine having the pain of cancer for the rest of your life? for eternity? Could you imagine staying in the pain of, of a sickness or a disease for eternity? So in God's grace, he actually allows us to die so that he can bring us back in perfection. Yes. Isn't that a loving God? Yes. But what, when, he, when the resurrection happened, what he said is like, he said, now the sting of death is gone. Death is a gift, but the sting of death is erased. Because isn't that really what we suffer? It's the sting, it's the hurt, it's the grief, 
It's the morning. But that's why those who believe can take hope in the resurrection. Y'all with me today? That's good news. But now the reign of death is in our lives. Another thing that happens is shame. We talked about what shame was last week. Shame is a word called disgrace, which means the moment we choose to rebel, we disconnect ourselves from the grace of God. And we said shame does not come from God. It is a self-produced emotion that comes from your own personal rebellion to God. And so that's where we're at. And in fact, the world reflects the condition of our souls. Do you notice what the Bible says right there? He says that the ground is cursed because of you. And so everything you see in the world is in its condition because of us. Paul even writes, the, writes about this in Romans chapter eight. Look what he says in verse 18. Yet what we suffer, everyone say suffer, suffer. now is nothing compared to the glory, everyone say glory, that he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. And check this out. Verse 20 reminds us, it alludes back to Genesis. Against its will, the ground is cursed because of you. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. I've never given birth to a child, but I've seen it happen three times. I mean, I've had a cold before. I'm sure it's kind of the same. <laughs> but how many of you know like there is a pain that you endure to go through the joy. If you're a mama in here, you can say amen to that, right? There's a pain you endure to get to the joy. And there's these things called contractions. The Bible says that when we see earthquakes, we see natural disasters, floods, tsunamis, it's actually the world crying out and groaning and in pain because of the curse. And it says it's longing, it's groaning. It's amazing because even in the midst of destruction, it's actually the gospel being preached. Every time you see destruction, it should remind you there's a day coming when God will restore things to its rightful place. And so it's, it's crazy because even the most beautiful places in the world, like I've been to the Grand Caymans, it's incredible. Like the, the ocean looks like a swimming pool. It's that clear. It's beautiful. But even the most beautiful places you've ever been, it's not even in its perfect state. How crazy is that? You ever heard on documentaries and like, this is a place on the earth that's been untouched by man. And you ever notice that everything that gets touched by man, death and decay begins to erode it. Like everything they try to say is science and all this stuff. I just laugh because it's like the Bible says that if y'all read it. They talk about climate change and global warming, all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, the Bible told us the earth is in decay because of our sin. It's happening all the time. But I love what Isaiah says. It's, in a, it's actually in Isaiah eleven six. if you wanna go read it yourself. But Isaiah actually prophesies about the day that God will restore things back to its original paradise. And he says, in that day, the wolf will lay down with the sheep and eat grass as the sheep. He says that a child will be able to tame a lion. Like, that's hard for us to fathom because you're terrified to get in the ocean, right? You've seen Jaws way too many times. You've watched Shark Week. You're like, I ain't getting in there. But you know, that's not how it was in the perfect paradise. The Bible says that we get, we're, have, we're given authority to rule over the creation. We were, we're supposed to swim with them, hang out with them. That's the original paradise. It says that when, the, when things are restored, it says the deserts will bloom. And it says, mountains will bring forth wine. Some of y'all are like, you're too excited about that one. <laughs> I knew I loved the Bible. <laughs> but like, we can't fathom a perfect creation, even the things that we think are perfect. We spend all of our days, we spend 360 or 358 days, it's 300, 365 minus seven is 358, right? 350, is that right? Is there 365 days in a year, Rob? All right, cool, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. 358, we spend 358 days a year trying to get to a beach somewhere that's imperfect. 
You ever got to your perfect beach and there's trash all over the beach? And there's, why? Because it's been touched by man. It's still not in its perfect state. How crazy is that? But God says that one day it'll be restored. But here's what we try to do. In our entire lives, we try to recreate paradise when God wants to restore it. And you know how we try to recreate it? We run to four things to try to get back to paradise. One is we run to ourselves. We think ourself is gonna fix it. In, in, a, in a culture that the, the best selling books in any genre is self-help books. You're the person that can't understand the Bible or is not a reader, but the moment you see six minute abs on the newsstand, you pick it up. How can I get that, All right? How to make, how to make money from home, how to, how to double your income from home. Like, let me pick that up. I gotta figure out how to, because some of y'all think, but if I can just get to this version of myself, my life will be better. It's been 10 years. How you doing, boss? You still there? But we do, can I tell you, you'll never find, you'll be hard pressed to find anybody that's lied to you more than you. And here you are, you can look back over your life and see the things you've done to mess it up and yet you still applaud your sovereignty. You're still better than God. You still got it more figured out than God because you're, you've watched YouTube videos. You've read news articles. So now you're intelligent and you know and how to debunk the Bible. Like this is where we're at, we seek ourselves. You ever heard of the disease anorexia? Where people starve themselves? The thing that's twisted about this disease is they, they create a twisted reality where when they look in the mirror, they actually see an overweight person. And they continue to starve themselves. Can I tell you what we suffer from is spiritual anorexia. You have a twisted view of yourself where you think that if I can just get better, if I can just be a better version of myself, I'll somehow find fulfillment and I'll somehow be better because I can earn my way to it. And so we go to ourselves thinking if I can just get better, I'll be all right. Can I go ahead and set some people free this morning? And this isn't an insult. It's just a moment that it needs to kind of set you free. You'll never be good enough for God. But that's the point is that we aren't good, he is. Number two, we run to others. We, want, uh, we think that others can fulfill us, get us back to paradise. If I can just find that, that Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. And, and it's funny because all of us think that this, if, once I find this, I'm going to be better. Can I tell you like, Jessica is amazing in my life. She is a gift from God, but she is not God. She doesn't make a good God. That man, he can't even hit the toilet. Like he can't even aim and that's your God? That's the God that's gonna bring fulfillment and peace to your life, right? I mean, just look at him right now. Just go ahead and look at him. That's not a good God. They're gonna fail you, aren't they? They're gonna let you down, aren't they? But why do we continue to run to others to try to fulfill us? You ever watch, listen, I don't, because I think it's stupid, but I know some of y'all, y'all are just crazy fans. Y'all love The Bachelor and Bachelorette and those stupid shows. Like, some of y'all love that stuff a little way too much, but it's funny. It's funny watching y'all on social media. It's real funny. Um, but y'all, like, talk about The Bachelor. And I'm just like, I wish for one season, can we get a normal-looking dude? I mean, like, he's balding. He's 35, lived with his mama his entire life. He's like got the dad bod, you know? Like, right, Rob? Come on, man. What, what? I mean, I think if, if you didn't have an amazing wife in Phyllis, I would nominate you to be on Bachelor. You know what I'm saying? Like, you would just be awesome. But you know what I'm saying? Like, every contestant on there is... <laughs> I love you, Rob. Every contestant on there, though, is like ripped. They're, they're like, we're going to dinner tonight in France. Like, I just want somebody to be like, hey, I got my Ford Taurus out front. You want to hop in? We're going to Waffle House. You know what I mean? It's not real. But they tell you, like, if you'll find this or if you'll look like this, you'll find paradise. You'll be happy. 
And it's not true. That's why yeah, it's the same people. You'll read about them on that paper that you buy for six-minute abs that says they've gotten a divorce. They're on antidepressant pills. Celebrities are killing themselves. Why? Because they thought this was the thing, and it's not paradise. Kids make terrible gods, but we make them gods of our homes, don't we? We let them be in charge. They rule the house. Listen, I'm coaching 6U baseball. They are terrible gods. <laughs> if you ever pray for patience, sign up to coach 6U baseball. <laughs> but it's funny watching the parents that put their four-year-olds out there at coach pitch baseball, and they're up there holding the bats upside down, standing on the plate like this, ready for the pitcher to pitch, and they're up there with a video. Look at him, he looks so awesome. He doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> but our kids, like they're, they just, they fart angel dust, don't they? They're just, can I say that? I don't know. It's, the, it's even the 8.30. Like I usually wait for the 11.30 to say that. But we do, we're just like, our kids are perfect. They're terrible gods. They let us down. You cannot put your hope in other people, but it's what we do. The third thing is we run to the world to try to recreate paradise. And this is the stuff that we try to gain from the world. Our culture loves this. And it's crazy because you thought to yourself, if I just had that vehicle, my life would be better. And you got the vehicle and you're still the same person. You just have more debt now. Like, you're like, if I just had that boat, if I just had that house, and you got the house and you're still a jerk, you got the man and you're still desperate. Like, those things don't change who you are. You're just that same person with more stuff and more debt. Like, have you ever heard of common graces? Common graces are things that God created for us to enjoy, but we began to worship the creation over the creator. And so non-believers don't know how to keep within the boundaries with the things God created us for us to enjoy. Believers should know where the boundaries are. So I'll just name three. There's more than three, but there are three main ones in our culture is food. Like God created food for us to enjoy, to say, man, thank you, God, for this amazing food. How many of you know, like God wants us to enjoy a good steak. He wants us to enjoy bacon. Thank God for the New Testament. <laughs> he loves it when we're down here, we're like, man, those cinnamon butter from Texas Roadhouse on them yeast rolls, though. Somebody, come on. Jesus is like, man, enjoy that. And we go, thank you, God, for this food, and we enjoy it. But the non-believer goes, I need this to comfort me. I need this to bring life to me. This, the food becomes the thing that I worship, and I spend all my time thinking and dwelling on eating food because now I've gone outside the boundaries. And how many of you know it leads to ail ailments? It leads to sickness. It leads to unhealthiness. Same thing with sex. Sex created, regardless of what your old youth pastor said when you were 13, where he said, don't, ha don't have sex, it's gross, save it for your spouse. <laughs> what? But it's saying like God created sex within the bonds of marriage to enjoy and to multiply. But he put boundaries around it, didn't he? Can I tell you this, like, people are like, why is religion just about a bunch of rules? God's just about a bunch of rules. If you are a parent of a two-year-old and you have stairs and you put up a gate, are you a bad parent or a good parent? Good. Last night, they were kind of confused. <laughs> You're a good parent. Why? Because you understand what that child doesn't understand, that if you go past this boundary, you're going to get hurt. That's why God puts the boundaries up. He's a good God because he knows I created this for you, but this is not what you worship. It's just something for you to enjoy. Wine's another one. Like a believer knows like, hey, I can enjoy a glass of wine. There's nothing wrong with it, but the unbeliever goes outside the boundaries. And it leads, anytime you begin to worship the creation and you make that your God, it leads to disease, destruction, and debauchery. Because you've gone outside the boundaries of what God asked you to do. 
God put it there for you to enjoy, but within the boundaries of what he did. He says, listen, here is food, enjoy it like this. Here is sex, enjoy it like this. But we said, listen, I, I need more of that. It's funny because even in our culture, they tell you, I know you've had sex, um, but it didn't fulfill you. So now the answer to that is go have more of it with other people. And it's funny because we think the answer to our problem is get more of what we already have. Same way with money, right? Like I remember an episode of Dave Ramsey, he was talking to this family, his guy called in and he's like, listen, we're just living paycheck to paycheck. It's hard, we can't seem to get out of debt. He said, well, how much, how much do you bring in the household? Me and my wife bring in 150,000. And he said, you know what? He said, I've talked to the same person who made 30,000, 75,000, 100,000, 200,000, and all of them have the same story. So let me ask you this question. Is it the amount that you make or is it what you do with what you make? And so the answer to all of our problems, we think, is I need to make more money. I need to have more. If I had more money, then I would blank. And we don't realize, no, your problem is not that you need more. The problem is you don't know the boundaries of what you already have. Am I preaching today? Because like some people would say this, well, I just don't see how a good God would send people to hell. He doesn't. We're already on our way there. You know that, right? Here's the problem. When I talked about this last week, the problem with, with Southern church culture is you think you were born in the garden. And then as long as you behave, you don't get kicked out. But how many of you know we were all born on the outside? We are on the Titanic going down. And every time you think that I can try to make my life better by my own hand, you are cleaning toilets on a sinking ship. And the whole point is that that's why John 3, 16 says, it's not his will that anyone should perish, but that all have everlasting life. That's why he saw the sinking ship and he offers a life raft and his name is Jesus. <laughs> and the last one is religion. Religion. I love the story about C.S. Lewis. Um, he, he had this uh, friend who was a, an atheist and this guy thought he was gonna trip C.S. Lewis up in his faith. And so he puts all over the room, he didn't put the names up, but he put all the religions on a wall. And he, was gonna, he thought, you know, I'm gonna trip him up, I'm gonna see if he can find which one's Christianity. And so he puts all the religions on the wall. C.S. Lewis comes in, he says, so? He said, can you tell me which one's Christianity? He didn't even have to look at the wall. He said, because he asked me, he said, what's the difference between Christianity and all these other religions? He said, I can answer that without looking at the wall. He said, it's grace. It's grace. It's the only faith out there that says it's not by your own good merits in which you earn salvation, but it's through the grace of God. Because every other religion says you've got to be good enough in order to get to heaven. Now, the problem is, You've adopted this religion because you think I'm not like that homeless drug addict. I'm not like that person who's been divorced three times. I'm not like that person who's done this. I'm not like that person who's been in a prison. I'm not. And so you think you compare your righteousness to other people. The problem is you're supposed to compare it to God. And how many of you know when you compare your righteousness to God, we're all in trouble. Because we've all lied. We've all been selfish. We've all stolen. We've all done things for our own pleasure. We're broken. You see, religion is man's attempt to appease God through works. And it does not work. Can I tell you a real sobering truth? Number four is just number one with church clothes on it. It's you trying to do good yourself, but hey, at least you got the church shirt church bracelet. I think some of y'all think you're going to get to heaven and Jesus is going to scan a bracelet for you to get in. Look, my WWJD bracelet, here it is. Bling, you're in. All those things are good, but they're not God. I mean, some of you even, you say like, man, I, I grew up at the first United Pentecostal Baptist Methodist Catholic Church. I don't know if that's a real thing, but some of y'all are like, I went to that church. But you do like you, you start claiming that as your, as your way to get in. That's religion. It's religion. And it can't 
it can't get you back to paradise. You cannot recreate what God will one day restore. You can't do it. It's impossible. And so here's the sobering truth. There is nothing in you that can bring rescue to you. That's the bad news. I told you it's gonna be bad news today. Do you wanna hear the good news though? You gotta come back next week.